15 years of their life, they would still be able to complete the range of that route. So the, the range we need to cover for these is probably about 150 miles a day, but they, they will be capable of doing 190 miles on a full charge. Right. That, that does come down um, depending on the weather and the climate. Obviously, we're in Manchester. We're not in the Bahamas, so it's generally wet and cold for 360 days of the year. Uh, so we have to factor that in when we're specifying the vehicles. So, so we went for a longer range. Um, the, these battery packs are, are capable of 380 kilowatt hours. So that gives us up to the 190 mile range that we need. Okay, that's good. Yeah, and they take a long time to charge back up. Then I know how you charge them. Well, again, for this system, quite quite different from what you get in like a car charging bay or a forecourse. We have rapid charges and we don't just have one. We have two charges plugged into one vehicle. So that gives us up to 80 kilowatts of charge. So we, we can do from naught to 100% charge in less than four and a half hours. Lovely. Thank you very much. I think at that point, I'll pass over to my colleague, Gareth. We might have some more questions. Amazing. So Chris, has Chris and um, Chris and Tony talked a lot about the infrastructure that was going on there with our, with these buses. Um, they've got they've got parts along the way that where you can charge a bus up as well. So you can charge a bus up using using charging points along its destinations as well. And these buses are going all the way from Manchester Airport all the way past Manchester University. They're going all the way to the Manchester hospitals as well. There's a lot that these buses have got to do. And as you said, the the affection, uh, the, sorry, not the affection, the weather that affects these sort of, the, those sort of changes. As soon as it gets anything like it was outside today, that range is going to drop down. And that's why these buses have got to be so well created and well managed by this company. And that's something that we'll get onto in our third section as well, that sort of the career aspect of it, of what kind of people they need to be involved to keep all these, keep all the wheels turning of these buses. So Chris, have we got any good questions that you've spotted from that? Maybe maybe two questions that we spotted from our Google Docs that we've, that we've possibly not been able to answer yet. Oh, Chris, you're on mute. Sorry, I unmuted myself and unmuted myself again. Uh, and the Google <laughs> got. Oh yeah, we've got questions on um, about mining for the batteries. Yeah, uh, yeah. How the capacity of the batteries um, is going to change with time, and are they really zero emission? Because uh, obviously they have to produce batteries and they have to be made, etc. Yes. Yeah. Oh, brilliant question. These are all questions that we're going to talk about later. That we've come up with school activities that possibly these are just research activities, and these are activities that you want to go home and send the your, your students have to do home learning on them. That was a question that Andy came up with as well a, a couple of days ago. Where did these batteries actually come from? Is it a UK manufacturing business or are we getting them from elsewhere in the world? How are they getting here? Yeah, so is it completely zero emission? And maybe these kids uh, can try and calculate how much emissions are, are actually coming out of one battery. Um, you'll be able to see in the next video how many batteries and, and what they look like. If you've ever if if you've ever listened to cabin pressure where you've had to imagine a hundred otters in one airplane, I want you to imagine a lot of batteries in the back of a bus, and we'll see if you if, see if it looks like what you're about to see. So, as we talked about Schiphol Airport before um, in Amsterdam, this is exactly what every single one of these electric buses go through. Collectively, they can run all day, 150 miles a day in Manchester, and then they go back to charge. The charge drop, each of these buses has two charging points as well. So each of our buses can be ran to full charge in a matter of in a matter of hours. Fully charged in 20 minutes, sees one in Schiphol Airport as well. So we now know the capabilities in stagecoach know have they they have almost a goal to get to in order to make our buses be able to charge fully in 20 minutes as well, with those charging routes en route. So we asked. Possibly that you could bring something with you to, to the talk. If you've not brought anything with you, that's fine. If you can have a look at, around you for a minute, we're going to spend a couple of minutes. If you can try and bring something to the computer with you and we'll have a look and we'll get Chris and, and Andy to have a, have a look and see what you've got. 
bring something to your screen that has a motor in it or is run off renewable energy. So something like a wind-up radio, it's run off sort of the kinetic energy that you're putting into it. Anything that you've got a solar panel on, maybe something small that you don't have to disconnect and you can actually bring to your computer screen. Um, but if you've got anything like that, Chris is going to be having a look. He's going to find the most interesting one. And we're going to actually show you how to build a simple electric motor that you could put anywhere you wanted to, to get electricity out of. So, Chris, is there any interesting ones coming up? Just looking now. Yeah. I think people are just uh, are going exploring. <laughs> yeah, get up. up. Get your seat. See, Go for a run. See a torch? A I torch, yeah. A calculator, which does have a solar panel on it. it. They do, yeah. So all students in the world are using, yeah, they should be using solar power calculators now. Oh, Roy's got a little uh, helicopter. Brilliant, yeah. Molly, I can't. Uh, Molly's got some sort of pig, and I'm not quite sure what it is. I think it's a clockwork right. pig. Is it Molly? Unmute it's yourself. Wind up pig, yes. Yeah, Molly, unmute yourself. Tell us about it. Wind up pig in blanket. I got it. I've got two. They race. My mum got me them for Christmas last year, but we just wind them up in there. They race. The, the <laughs> vegan alternative for Sunday uh, for a Christmas <laughs> lunch. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Run off. Yeah. Oh, run off wind up, wind up power, putting a bit of kinetic into it. What Molly's winding up herself, she's got that energy from the sun and from the and the chemical energy that she's eating in her food. Um, so yeah, these are all things that get taught right from year seven. They should, and they should, in our in our thoughts, be taught right from primary school. All of these things are available to children right from the right from the day of the born. Yeah, let's get one more interesting thing, Chris or Andy. Let's see if we can get someone else to talk about it. I thought Meg, Megan maybe had something, but I'm not sure. Oh, no, she's shaking her head, sadly. Um. <laughs> I think Rich might have a, an operated, a, a wind-up kind of torch. I've got a wee, like, torch my mum gave me. It has a wee, the hand pump turns the gear. Shine it at us, Rich. And it yeah. shines. It's really Ooh. bright. That's really, yeah. really bright, yeah. Actually yeah. really dead powerful. Brilliant. And so, Rich, what kind of um, energy are you putting into that torch then to make it turn it into electrical energy? Kinetic energy. Yeah, yeah a bit of kinetic yeah. energy. And that <laughs> kinetic energy, again, the same as Molly, has come from food, which stores your chemical energy. Um, it's come from the sunlight, yeah, which is giving you just energy all the time when you go outside. That's why you should always get your kids outside. Don't let them sit inside during lunch. Don't let them sit inside the room with you at break time. Send them out. Tell them they've got to get themselves some energy. So yeah, all brilliant things. This is what you've got to look out for. And that pigs and blankets, take that into your class. Kids would love to have a race with them. Kids would love to play with that torch. And it's been proven every single time that me and me, Chris or Andy have done a lesson as well. Bring them in. Kids love to, to mess around with stuff. So one that we had the pleasure of messing around with was given to us by our good friend, other Chris that we knew. Um, he did a practical demonstration for us and, and taught us all what to do. All you need is some neodymium magnets. So these can be bought from, I bought these off Amazon, and they can be bought from any independent retailer as well, not including Amazon, it's up to you. Um, different strengths, I've got tiny little ones. So you think they're not gonna give that much energy, but you'll see in a minute. Today, I've not got renewable energy, unfortunately, because I'm sat inside, it's freezing cold, and I didn't want to go and stand outside with my wind turbine. So I've brought myself a Panasonic, Panasonic AA battery, other battery providers are available, and a simple bit of copper wire. These are the three things, all the three things you need to make a motor that, that we've put inside those state coach buses that turn electrical energy into rotary, into rotary movement. So all you have to do is if you put your batteries on a surface, I've got them connected to my other batteries so I can wiggle them around and they don't fall over. We're gonna put our battery right on the top. So you're gonna put the flat end of your battery on the flat end of your magnets like this and it'll click. Magnetize together, look, it's not gonna fall off. Look, luckily. And then you need to shape your copper wire. So the top of your copper wire here will touch the top of your battery. The bottom of your copper wire will then touch right at the bottom of these magnets. So I've got six magnets, seven magnets, sorry, in a row. 
It's going to touch the bottom of one of the bottom two. And by doing that and not connecting in any other place, we're creating an electric circuit. And that electric circuit will run for as long as that battery runs. And when you see it in a minute, when it, it shows how much energy is inside one of these things. There's only 1.5 volts inside this battery. Every single second that the sun beats down on the earth, we get millions times more amount of energy than in this inside this simple battery. So for every second of sun's energy, you could run this copper wire just as I'm about to do now. So I'm gonna set it off and I'm gonna show you on screen about what we've got. So that copper wire, you've got the bottom of the copper wire that's just about touching the bottom of the, the magnets. You've got the top of the copper wire that's just about touching the top of the battery. And the electrical energy that's passing through that copper wire using that magnetic field is powering that, is powering that. Now this does run out very quickly as I found out yesterday. I left one of these on for about a few minutes and then tried it again today and it didn't work. So I had to go and get myself a new battery. But that's something really simple that you can do in your class and we've done as a class and it works really, really well. Getting, getting them to do different shapes as well. If you make a heart shape out of your copper wire, then the top of this heart shape here can sit on the top of your battery. And as long as the bottom of that heart shape touches the magnets, you can make a heart spin. There's so many different ideas. And as long as you get your kids to discover it themselves, they're gonna be able to create a simple electric motor that's gonna turn electrical energy into rotary power. So we've got these electric buses, but where does this electricity come from? As I've just had a battery, it was using the battery, it was using electrical energy that was made in a factory that wasn't very good. So really that's not renewable. We don't wanna rely on that. We don't wanna to have to put big batteries that are already charged up off the grid in our buses. So Stagecoach teamed up with a company called Centrica. There's one of the, this is a company that's in Salford. Um, it's near the Mawson building, near the Pure Gym. Um, you can go and drive by if you wanted to. There's not much to see unless you're inside. I'm sure they'll keep everyone hush, hush, hush. But they originally just worked on wind turbines. So they were the main providers in the Manchester area that went out and built wind turbines for other companies. But they now have delved into making these charging stations for stagecoach. So the charging units include on-site solar generation, each bus is equipped with two charging points, like we said, to make it super charging. Um, almost like any new phone that you'll buy today, you can charge it within an hour to full charge. And you can do the same with the buses. So it's recharging just three, three and a half hours, I think that one says. Not long at all. And these, I don't know if anybody spotted any of these. Can, can anybody come on? Anybody that's seen one of these around the country or around Manchester? Can anybody come in and tell us about what they look like? I see them all the time because I all the time because I live in town. Um, yeah, they look really nice and they're so quiet, like you don't really hear them. And I think they've got, you know, new cars have that like cutout when they stop at traffic lights and then they start up yeah. again, so it's not wasting electric. But they look really nice, much better than they look really flash. Yeah, look really. Yeah, because if I said if anybody's been on um, a, a mega bus, I went on a mega bus a few years ago down to London. If you pay a bit extra, you get the premium mega bus. So you get your plug-in units. You get you can plug in your laptop. You get Wi-Fi on the bus, which is just crazy. Uh, moving Wi-Fi, it's everywhere nowadays. But these buses all have that as well, all powered off these batteries. So it's not just the bus itself that's pulling itself along. It's your whole world. You could live on one of these buses. Thank you, Molly. So the next bit of the video, we're going to be talking about the physics behind these buses. So we want you to create two questions again on that on that word bank. We've got uh, we've got three here laid out by Chris. So how does the battery pa battery power make the bus move? Why does the battery bus weigh so much more than diesel bus? And how does the rate of battery technology affect the progress of electric vehicles? So I'll play it now. We'll get onto it. And I think we'll be, we should be able to watch the whole of this section. Questions for you there on the batteries. Thank you. Okay. Hey, thanks, Chris. Um, so Tony, I was gonna go more into the sort of the monster underneath the bus. Um, but bridging back over to what Chris said, you said there was a 15-year lifetime on the bus. Is that on the whole bus, or is that just on the battery? Uh, we, well, we expect to run a vehicle. When we purchase a vehicle, we, we judge the whole life cost over a 15-year period. 
Right. Now, the, the, the batteries are guaranteed for five years, but as a, as a business, we've specified a longer warranty period up to 10 years. We, we want at least 10 years. No, we'll get 190 miles out, out of these vehicles. Yeah. So, okay. the, with, the, with the technology being so new, it is quite an unknown quantity of, of how long and how durable these battery packs are going to be. But so yeah. far, we're good. Yeah, that's what you're talking about, the maintenance and that. You've got to wait a few years, I suppose, yeah. Um, yeah. Does the, when you were talking about you've got the USB and the Wi-Fi, does that drain any power that you could then add it back on? If you got rid of that, could you say it went 200 miles, 210 miles? It, it has a bearing on it. I mean, the USB and the Wi-Fi is a very low draw, so it's probably less than 1% of the battery capacity. The biggest draw on an electrical vehicle now is the heating. So you think there's quite quite a lot of space on a double deck vehicle that needs to be at a constant temperature. Um, so if, if we were starting these from cold in the morning on a cold day, like minus two, it would probably take 90 minutes to get up to about 19 degrees. And that could take up to about 25 percent of our actual capacity. So what we're, what we're developing now with the smart charging system is that while the charging overnight, the bus will be preheated as it's charging. So it'll take a low draw, get the vehicle up to an ambient temperature of about 19, and then that'll reduce the uh, the draw on the batteries throughout the day then. That's brilliant, yeah. So, and also you've advertised on your website, I think it is, that you've got charging as the bus moves around the route, is that correct? Uh, well, they, they do regenerate the charging as the yes. vehicles are, are moving it de depends on the braking schedules to be honest there's a lot of regenerative braking as the driver presses the brake pedal so the the more he brakes in effect the more charge it, it feeds back into the battery but it is quite low to be fair it's not a yeah. game changer. that's fine yeah um so the actual batteries themselves um are they similar to the batteries that we have in our phones are just beefed up versions yeah, pretty much with my own batteries, um, but they're in big banks. They're probably in a set of 16 banks on this vehicle. And we have to try and find spaces where we could cram, cram in more battery packs to get more range. Um, so under the bonnet, there's probably about 12 large packs, so probably about 100 times of what's in your phone, times that again by 16. Um, and then there's a few more dotted around the undercarriage of the vehicles at various places where we could. Amazing. So you can watch this full video, obviously, when we send you all the stuff on the website. I'm going to skip forward to the point where he actually shows us the batteries inside the bus because you don't want to hear me talking any more than I already have to. Uh, do you know um, what the weight difference is between that and a diesel engine? The weight difference is that, sorry? Yeah, of the batteries compared to an engine. Yeah, um, the overall difference in vehicle uh, weight is probably about a ton. It's probably about a ton difference. Right. Well, so is that a ton more, more for it or less? More. More, yeah. A lot more, yeah, for the electric yeah. vehicles. Um, it's just the volume of the batteries, really. Yeah. And that it's coming back onto the bus then, isn't it? With an engine? Yeah, um, the overall difference in yeah. vehicle uh, weight probably about a ton it's probably about a ton still coming back in. Well, there we go yeah. i'll pause it then yeah there's a lot like you said <laughs> the six banks you can see there there we go so that is what a bank of batteries look like um as he said they're scattered throughout the bus as well in every single part that you could ever think of that that isn't being used anymore um i'm yet to go on one of these buses so i don't know whether i'm assuming they still have those higher up seats at the back that everybody likes to sit on that you can get away with we get away with anything um but these batteries are massive these batteries are huge and not unlike your phone battery as well so again another thing you can take into a class with you your phone every child has a phone every child is familiar with a phone um you could have something maths you could be weighing your phone you could be then know how many are in a bus and try and figure out the weight of, of what you're going to be sort of seeing as well but you'll be able to watch the rest of that video um once you once you log on to our website at the end of this conference so what we're going to do is we're going to carry on so why should we do this um we've not really delved into it yet i think i asked a question in that video as well but all this electricity have got to come from somewhere and luckily tony has told us that this electricity comes from a renewable source as well 
Um, I don't know whether anyone wants to put in the chat of any companies that they know of or they might use um, that, that give them renewable energies as well. So would they give them their electricity and they give them um, that powers their ovens and their microwaves and their heating, their lighting. Yeah. And so does anybody have a company that does this renewably at the moment? I think we've got one from Molly there, Chris. I think I saw her typing. Yeah, sorry, trying to get through. Yeah, St. No, Octopus it's... mentioned so energy. Yeah, yeah. Good energy. Good energy. Perfect. So two that I've not heard of. Yeah. yeah. I think quite a few of the big companies I'm with Eon, and I think now our electricity is from renewable. Yeah, yeah. Quite a lot of companies doing it. Yeah, because a few years ago, there was only a few. Well, there were, I knew of Octopus, and I'm on Bulb at the moment. They do it. But it's good to hear, yeah, that Eon and, and Place are doing it as well. So these cities would be much cleaner. And that, an excellent example that we've been given ne with a sort of less excellent, um, less excellent reason, but because of COVID, um, we've actually had much cleaner airways in our cities. And this is what we're, this is what we're running towards. Manchester was a not, a, not an extremely heavy polluted city, but it was a very polluted city up until these sort of things happening. Now we've got bike lanes, we've got specific bus lanes, we've got electric buses. And this has happened in London as well. I don't know if anybody saw photos of China during COVID and um, the smog had completely gone. It was bright blue skies. And as soon as lockdown ended, all the smog was back. So this is something that we've got to avoid. And these are things that you can flash up to your students and show the differences between renewable and non-renewable energies. Again, these things are happening in year seven, so you can talk about them all the, right the way through. So non-renewable, there's no direct emissions. No, and this is going into that research task that we were talking about. So is there any emissions along the way through transport, through mining? Um, the fuel used is finite and will run out eventually when we're using non-renewable. Whereas renewable, the fuel is infinite. You can use it for as long as our universe a universe exists. So at least within our lifetime, we're, we'll, we'll do quite well from it. So last part of the video, we'll watch this. We'll watch a couple of minutes here because this is, I think, the longest part of it as well. And then we'll go back to some of your questions as well to fill it in before we start talking about stuff that you should, that we, we'd like you to have a look at in the future and you to pass on to your students as well because these are the people who need, who are the best at social media and the best at sort of talking to others and getting them used to what's going on. So I'm going to find 14 minutes and we've got our lovely Andy Howes to take us through this bit. I'm sorry about that. I was talking over you, but that's not what teachers are supposed to do, obviously. <laughs> um, but I was just thinking when you said about five years time, Tony, and, uh, and where it might be heading, you know, we, we've, we're, we've got, teachers obviously working with kids in school who in five years time, some of them will be coming into the job market. Some of them will be coming into Manchester looking for jobs in all sorts of sectors. Um, could you just give us a sort of feel of the sorts of jobs that they might come into if they were, if they were looking to work with Stagecoach in terms of the, the maintenance of this fleet of buses or um, things relating to this, so the, the development of this infrastructure that you're talking about? Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the, the engineering industry, especially in buses, has, has changed massively over the last five to 10 years. I mean, I started off as an apprentice um, heavy vehicle mechanic when I was 16. And back then, you know, it was all about oils. It was quite a dirty job. Everything was very manual, you know, big hammers, large um, tools to use all the time. It's quite a, a lot of heavy lifting. Now it's developed more of, you know, we're diagnosing problems with a laptop. Um, it's a very more analytical, technical job than it was years ago. Um, you're not using your senses of smell and, and hearing like you used to years ago. Now it's all computer based. We're trying to be more proactive. So we're developing systems with the manufacturers. So the vehicle will actually tell us when there's a potential problem coming. So we're looking for patterns. Okay. So we're really looking for for engineers and budding engineers who are interested in developing systems and, and technology is obviously the biggest driver for us at the moment. Um, not just electrical vehicles, but hydrogen 
fuel cells as well are, are going to be part of public transport. Uh, we've got synthetic fuel engines coming through as well. So it's all these sorts of things you you don't necessarily associate with, with buses and transport, but, but it's coming, it's here now, and it's only going to develop even more. So, I mean, it's so interesting hearing you say that, Tony, because I think a lot of people, maybe a lot of teachers, have in their minds that buses are a kind of a, you know, they don't really see buses in that way. They see it as a sort of something they already know and they don't really think about. And it, and it is a bit dirty and you, know, you associate it with a lot of... Uh, diesel fumes and so on and you're talking about something that's completely different what can you just give us a feel for um stagecoach in greater manchester how many bus roughly how many buses have you got in total on the on the network we've got just over 800 buses at the moment right uh, we are the largest bus operator in um, manchester and we're the largest bus operator outside of london as a whole right. you know there's a lot of fleet we've got six um, large workshops um, engineering staff, we've got just over 300 engineers and there's various roles within that from vehicle inspectors to master technicians. Then we have supervisory teams, quality auditors, all, all come through the ranks at one stage of, of another um, doing some sort of engineering discipline. Mm. But in the, in the future, and, and even now we're training up our guys to be more electrically biased, um, mm people who can analyze data, like I said before, um, and, and, and basically monitor these systems. It's not like just the vehicle comes in at night now and is fueled and washed. We have to manage the system, the charging rates, and work out which bus is going to be ready for what time for the service in the morning. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot more to a bus depot than there was five, ten years ago. Um, we've also got the manufacturing industry who make the vehicles are obviously looking for design engineers, application development engineers. So it's not all the likes of Google and Amazon who are, who are looking for high-tech engineers. It mm -hmm. is everywhere at the minute. And I mean, and, and bus has really got a big intake looking for engineers. It's, it's something we've probably struggled with recruitment over the last 10 years. Right. As we spoke about before, it was seen as a bit of a dirty, not so sexy industry. So you've heard it from the horse's mouth. Stagecoach is, is there to, to hire all of your students after they finish college. Um, but if you've got any industry background as, as well, you can talk about this with your kids. You can talk about this with your kids now. And I know me, Chris and Andy were very excited um, to find out that Tony is very willing to drive by your school in, a, in an electric double-decker bus and get all your kids to get on board. And he's also very willing for you if you, if you get in contact with him and take the proper channels to have you guys come over, I mean, after COVID permitting, to have you guys come over and have some sort of field trip over there. It just opens more doors, because I know I, I had two years in engineering, Chris has had sort of years in the Royal Air Force. A lot of these things are, a lot of these things we didn't know about, and a lot of these things your kids won't know about, going on, going on buses. Um, they usually get a lift off the parents in the morning, I suppose, or give it a walk. So, getting into school activities from this we've come up with a few and we've put a couple together that we'll put on the website at the end that you can download and you can take yourself and flesh out a little bit maybe change them to the aspects that your kids work best at but we've got as simple as advantages and disadvantages of these buses and um, that can be a whole a whole task can be put straight onto that we've got targeted research looking into where does this energy come from Research it from news articles that you can give them. You can link that into climate change. You can link that into engineering when they get, they get to GCSE if your school is doing that as a topic as well. And yeah, where do these materials come from? So we, we found out that most of the lithium that goes into these batteries is mined or is made in Chile, China, and Australia. We've only four major companies. Um, so this is not a UK-based operation. This is not something that Centrica have done themselves and Swaco have done themselves who make the who make the, the batteries. This is something, this is a worldwide collaboration that you need to find you need to find out and you need to tell your kids to find out about as well. And we've also put that discover how to build a motor video on there as well. So you can show your kids if you need to watch back this recorded lecture to watch me and Chris do it, or you need to watch a video of someone else doing it. There's loads of these things on YouTube and that links it to all your electricity topic, which everybody goes through throughout all of the years. 
Now this last page, we'd very much like you as well to add, if someone would like to add right onto the bottom of that Google document where we put all of our questions, if you could add in any sort of videos or blogs or interesting talks that you've heard and listened to or heard of that are about what we, what we should do now, they're about climate change, they're about the ecological impact that we're putting on the world. We've come up with a few. So there's Paris to Pittsburgh on Netflix. There's Down to Earth on Netflix with Zac Efron, which I can personally vouch for. It's even better than High School Musical. Um, we've got ecotourism on YouTube. Simple things. There's a blog my, by my good friend, uh, My Less Waste Journey. She's done a lot of um, getting rid of waste from her life. Stop using one-use plastic. Stop using single-use bags. Wrapping all your Christmas presents in brown paper rather than present paper because it's non-recyclable which I didn't know until this Christmas but there's lots of stuff like that so we'd ask you to add as much as you can onto that last resource and we can add in um so that's about all that I have to say I don't know if, if Andy or Chris want to add anything on at the end uh, no just to emphasize we've had a, a things going in the chat about um the other sorts yeah. of mentions of this so that there are a lot <laughs> clearly even just in terms of buses um there was that bit of the the video where we got talking about gender and yes. uh, yeah i think that's really important that that um you know he was acknowledging this has been a, a male dominated industry uh, and he's seeing it changing and and he's welcoming that um so there are i think there are sections in the video that could be useful for um for other purposes and for you know uh, making sure that different messages are, are getting home. So do have a look at the complete videos, which will be on the pgcgreen.co.uk uh, website, hopefully by tomorrow, so that everything is available for you. Um, yeah, so that's that was one thing I was going to say. Chris, I don't know if you want to do other thing. Uh, not particularly, no. I think, like I say, if anybody wants to add in, like, it's So, repeat, yeah, so there may be questions that people have got. Um, please stick them in the chat or just shout out. Um, we've got another five minutes before we need to finish. So it'd be really good to hear questions and thoughts that you've got. I'm just looking back through the chat, seeing what else is already there. Um, I noticed that, uh, Zahira, we have you here as a solar power engineer. So I don't know if you wanted to say anything about your experience Uh which obviously feeds straight into the idea of the electric bus as a as a zero carbon or close to zero carbon, at least in terms of consumption um, vehicle. Um, I wouldn't go as far as calling myself an engineer. Sorry. OK, <laughs> but um, yeah, I have worked on renewable energy, primarily solar energy, and we were looking at um, implementing this idea of smart cities to make them completely reliant on renewable energy. And I kind of implemented this idea to my year sevens when I, in my placement one. So just thinking about what a city needs to survive on, including food. And we, um, there was a lot of fish farming as well and vehicles. Um, so they had a lot of brilliant ideas. And there was this one particular um, island that I was working on in um, North of Scotland called Campbelltown. And I think they had one of the largest airstrips in either the UK or Europe that wasn't being used. So we were trying to kind of bring the idea of um, making a base for NASA there. So a way to make rocket fuel so that they could use that for NASA. Um, so that, that, that was kind of ideas and they were really interested the year sevens to learn about how you can make something completely reliant on renewable energy and you don't need any um, other like sources of energy like so you could get wind um solar and tidal energy as well um and you don't need to use fossil fuels so yeah um these are all such, such fascinating ways of, of hooking hooking young people into the idea that there's something interesting here and there's something really to think about um, which is half of the half of the problem isn't it it's got to get them interested uh, and i think that's part of what this bus thing does. But then if you talk about NASA and uh, possibilities of, of renewable space flight, <laughs> renewable powered space flight and so on, again, you're, you're opening up just possibilities. And it doesn't mean that we want everybody to go and work for NASA on that particular project, but it's about 
um, there's something here for, for, for you. That's brilliant, Zahir. Thank you very much. Um, and hopefully we can carry on producing and creating uh, resources like these, um, which Gareth and, and Chris have put together and sharing them and making, you know, making it more available to not just ourselves in the PGC, but more widely so that they can be taken up and used uh, within the science curriculum. It's really brilliant sort of start here. So I just want to finish by saying thank you very much to Gareth and Chris. Um, really wonderfully put together. Thank you so much for all you've put into it. Demonstration worked perfectly, which doesn't is not always the case for physics demonstrations. <laughs> I'm impressed to see that. And uh, yeah, as people have said in the chat, lots to take away. Thank you so much.